Welcome back to another episode of Interview Out, where we teach you how to use the Amazon Leadership Principles to land your dream job. The reason we focus on the Amazon Leadership Principles is, well, because it's a really successful company and, well, you know, that's kind of how they run the business. And it's a really effective way to deliver feedback, but also a really effective way to think about bucketing up your stories and delivering your content in your interviews. This week's candidate is a senior product manager uh, who is targeting a job at an Amazon, Microsoft, Fang type company. Uh, and the leadership principle that we are targeting is a customer obsession. The question that I asked was about a time that they were able to see around the corner to deliver something a customer didn't know they needed or wanted. The reason I love this question so much from a customer obsession leadership principle point of view is that it really does highlight whether or not as a product manager you understand your customer right uh there's the old henry ford or the quote that's attributed to henry ford like you know he was asked well if i give customers what they want i'd give them a faster horse and not build a car i think that was proved to be true but i don't know so don't quote me but the rea the, the story remains which is look Customers may not always know what they want, which is why sometimes you need someone like Steve Jobs to say, yeah, that's not how we're gonna do a mobile phone. We're gonna do it this way. It turns out he was really, really right. Uh, and all the keyboard warriors who demanded on their Blackberries, the keyboard couldn't go away, well, they lost. Why? Because you can make a much better phone when you have more screen to work with. Um, so the ability to see around the corner and really think about what a customer wants and think deeply about what a customer wants allows a product manager to really, really shine uh, and do fantastic things. And so that's why I love this question. Let's see what the, uh, what the candidate had to say. I'm starting to get a sense of uh, what you've done and what you've accomplished, which is good. It's helpful. Yeah. And so I think at, what I'd like to ask now, and, and I th think this will be specific to um, uh, to your current company, Aperia, but, um, but maybe not. Maybe you have to go back a, a company or two and that's, and that's fine. Yeah. So uh, one of the core requirements of a product manager, a great product manager is being able to um, see around the corner, right? And anticipate right. the needs of a customer before the customer really understands that they have them. Yeah. And so I think, I'm trying to think how I want to ask this question. You've already talked about the onboarding experience. So let's not use that because I think that could be okay. a valid answer here, but you've already talked about it. So let's not use that. But, but walk me through a time when you created or spec'd out a product uh, to meet a customer need that ended up being a delighter for the customer? Hmm. I don't have anything. As a product manager, I, because a lot of my uh, products has been in the zero to one stage. So which is been It's really important to understand that this is a totally fine answer, by the way. Uh, you might have only ever worked at a startup. You might have none of the relevant work experience, but the question is asked. It is totally fine. It's not a failing on your part uh, to try and figure out how to get to what the, the interviewer is trying to answer, right? What they're trying, what they want from you um, by being kind of openly honest about, okay, well, I'm not really sure I can answer that question the way you wanted to. So either let's broaden the question or let's, let's figure something else out. So just want to kind of point that out. It's not an immediate death knell if you don't have the immediate experience to apply to the question as asked in an interview. Basically getting, uh, so the first two products that I worked in, the first product, uh, you know, I joined uh, and then we launched the product and uh, the, the product got shut down because, you know, the investors had a conflicting product in a different ecosystem. And the second product that I launched, that was also zero to one. It took some time to launch, but, uh, you know, it was mostly in the, uh, well, by the time I left the company, we had just, we were still in the acquisition stage. Or you know that that part of the funnel where in acquiring new users and trying to get them to product value, and there was a little bit of flux uh, in terms of you know who the I mean as is uh, normal around a lot of companies when you have a lot of stakeholders, the priority of the product moves down. So because I was just one product manager and there was you know a product head, a lot of people in that ecosystem. So have I def uh, designed a system that brought delight to a customer? Uh, practically, I don't think so, but... And, and that's fine. Let's... Critical important here, though. This is going to be a theme throughout this interview, just giving you a heads up. There's a lot of words when less words could be used. The right answer is only as long as it needs to be and not one word longer. This candidate did not get that memo. Let's, yeah. let's instead then talk about the, the customer onboarding. Did you actually end up implementing any form of customer onboarding? Yeah, I mean, I have for uh, different products. So no, I no, no, for, for, the, for the current product on which you're working. 
right? No, so for the current product, yeah, the new uh, designs that we are coming up with, it has got a, you know, it's got onboarding, it's got documentation. So I have this plan altogether where we design this. I will have uh, another resource working on documentation so that, you know, when somebody comes in, they know exactly what they're getting out of the platform, they know where to look up. Uh, there's a, what do you call it, a chatbot so that somebody can, uh, you know, even if I'm the only one in customer support, there's always somebody to reach out, and so they're not stuck anywhere. So uh, let's say one of the biggest uh, differences is, uh, so earlier when I joined, the onboarding was not exactly a pure place sign up. It was basically somebody entered a feedback form saying that I'm interested in the platform, then somebody contacted them. You then gave them a link to a sign up form. And so that journey itself was broken. So one of the easiest things I said, you know, put a sign up button there. This is what everybody expects, expects nowadays, right? Nobody wants to, because that's a broken journey. Because by the time you contact him, you know, he might have forgotten about your product and gone somewhere else. Yep. So one of the first things that we did is just put a button on the home page. The home page might be bad, but put a sign up button there. Let them get into the product and we'll figure things out after that. And so what, what coming into that situation, right? You had obviously your background information, your knowledge that you'd gained over the years, but you were also trying to learn a new customer base yeah. um, in a new space. What, yeah. what was it that told you that the customer wasn't going to get there on their own, that they weren't the, the smart customer who would figure out what, why, why did you believe that to be true? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, Mom, and let me just jump in real quick. So just as a learning point for, the, the candidates among you who are watching this video. When asking a question about customer obsession, specifically this one, which is, you know, you're looking around a corner and you're giving something a customer that they didn't know they were going to need or want. This is a great follow up question because it oftentimes catches candidates out because they, they really, they didn't, they think they've done something new or novel and they really have it. Right. And so when I ask, and this is a, this is, you know, again, this is stolen from stolen such a such a tawdry word uh, borrowed liberally from the documentation given to candidates or uh, sorry internal uh, employees at Amazon when interviewing this is one of the questions that gets asked a lot uh, and this is a follow-up question um, the asking them why didn't they think or how did they know their customer wouldn't have gotten there on their own really forces them to examine their answer right did they really do something novel did they really truly understand their customer so much that they were able to do something that the customer wouldn't have done on their own um, because sometimes you know the answers that we get quite frankly they, the customer would have gotten there on their own or they would have asked for it on their own or they've already been asking for it and they just didn't ask for it loud enough and that gets confused as to you know peeking around the corner so that is the kind of context for this question and it you know certainly is as you're preparing for your interviews customer obsession if you're a product manager is a hugely important uh, leadership principle to, to think about uh, if you're no matter what company you're interviewing at if you're going to focus on leadership principles customer obsession is definitely one of them uh, if you're going to talk about things where you're delivering things customers or delighting customers with things they didn't know they needed you better be able to speak to how do you know that they weren't going to get there on their own because it will be asked or if it's not uh, you sound even better for having answered the question and, and you know thinking ahead coming in as a product manager it's basically yeah that's the first thing that you learn right that's making an assumption that uh, a customer is going to figure shit out just because you've built something so i mean it took me a while to learn that but because coming from a developer background uh, you expect things to fail i had the same fallacy or the same bias that you know i've built it in a certain flow that people would figure that out but then the first two products that I built in, and it was, you know, simple enough, but, you know, the kind of questions that we're getting from customers were all different. So that really tweaked my view in saying that there is no such thing as a smart customer. There are people, uh, you know, the user personas that you build for, and they might, uh, you know, use the product in a completely different way. So I had uh, users trying to game my previous product, you know, come up with different uses. So that particular knowledge I brought to uh, the current uh, company that I work for. Now, the biggest challenge in terms was not just in, uh, I, I would say it, it's an expectation mismatch, right? So say, for example, so when I came in, the biggest challenge that I was expecting was, okay, fine, uh, how do I implement a product management practice here? The uh, bias that I came in was with that everybody would understand uh, the product life cycle or how a product management uh, you know, uh, department functions, 
you know, in any modern company in terms of there is user research, uh, you know, there's somebody who mocks up wireframes and, you know, then uh, the process for the user story is, you know, the design is there, somebody designs it, I pass it on to the developers, then the other challenge is, let's say if a design is not working, if the user says it's not working, then we have to reiterate and you know, come up with a better way or work on it. So that is something that I think almost every modern organization works with in terms of that is your normal product department. That is the expectation that I came with here, but that was all. Right? So if you're, if you're talking about you know, the stakeholders have different expectations in terms of they wanted somebody to manage the work, but in terms of if somebody said, okay, you know, if the user is not, uh, or let's say they're not using the platform, it's either a sales problem or it's a problem with something else, right? It's not a matter of, okay, you've designed something, you learn it, and then you iterate on top of it. So you, know, you could say it was my expectation was slightly misguided also, but it's been great like that in terms of understanding that, you know, yeah. So everybody's understanding of product management is not the same as you know, what we are coming in. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna talk at the end of this video about length of answers. So I'm not going to do that here, but just know that we're going to have a talk. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I guess, I guess the first question is how, how you've launched, well, no, you've, it sounds like you've launched some of the onboarding stuff, right? Um, what has been the impact of your solutions? Um, so what we had is we, uh, the initial thing, let's see, uh, the first thing was the understanding of the user. Right? So I told you in the beginning that I came in a completely new domain. So I had to assume that uh, the users are uh, the user study was right, and I would focus on the domain knowledge itself. So I would learn about the domain while we built, keeping the user persona that was in their mind when they developed the product. So what happened was over a period of time. So we had. Uh, the payroll solution that we created basically had the understanding that it was built for a first time entrepreneur or somebody who's new to payroll. It was supposed to be, uh, these, uh, this was going to be the majority user, right? Somebody who does not understand the laws, does not understand the process at all. This kind of user is going to come in, he's going to figure it out and he can start making payments to his employees. So this was the predominant uh, user persona. A second user persona would be somebody like a chartered accountant, somebody who mostly flows, but whose requirement is going to be, uh, you know, much higher than what an MVP could provide. So these are two different kinds of users that we had. Now, after while I was learning about the domain and all of that, I was doing side by side calls with all these people, with all my users. What after? I mean, uh, even I did the entire spiel. You know, whenever I was pitching the product to new uh, users, I would say, you know, this is designed for somebody who's new to the system. You don't have to worry about all the laws and all that. It turns out our understanding of the user persona was wrong, and uh, basically, there's no such thing as somebody who's going to come in. Uh, you know, somebody who does not understand the system, he's going to start using it. Invariably, those kind of users are going to go away, and he's going to hand it off to somebody who actually understands the process. So knowing that means I had to change the priority of you know all the features that are going to be developed. So to give you a very quick example, so if I my the you an entrepreneur, he does not really care about reports. He just wants to process his payroll payout, his employees. And the, on the other hand, if I have a chartered accountant, what he's going to do is he wants more reports because that's going to help him in communication with his clients. He does not really care about you know doing his salary payout. All of those things. When it clicked for me that you know the dominant user is actually a chartered accountant or you know people of that persona type, so that means I had to prioritize what these guys have. So luckily, what we had is uh, we went for a channel partnership wherein I am not running a marketing campaign and trying to figure out uh, users from the wild. I had a partner who was basically helping us uh, do uh, our calculations and all of that. So I basically started tapping into that particular network uh, in terms of, you know, uh, they were basically, they had around 75 members in that particular company. So I said, you know, give me all your fresh users, somebody who's not used to a platform. 
let me know what are they looking at you know what are the features that they want for their clients and slowly when we started implementing in terms of reports in terms of the uh, you know uh, our uh, backlog changed and to cater to this particular user so in one of the easiest examples that i could give you was so there is a certain uh, to run payroll there's like five steps and we have to lock it at the end so that you know you can't change it month on month the chartered accountant wants a process where they can unlock this process right so now how do i give them that because the entire assumption is nobody's going to lock it or unlock it because we don't want to give that flexibility to a new user uh, somebody who is not familiar with the payroll process uh, so the assumption was you know if this guy wants to change it this particular user who's new to payroll he has to come contact us and basically we will unlock it from the back end make the changes and you know so they don't uh, become non compliant with your statutory regulations and stuff like that but this is some this modification is something that a chartered accountant does on his day to day basis yeah so developing a process that allows them you know on the dashboard without us getting into it, that was a feature that they wanted this is something that we prioritize and let go or this is something that they have been sure i get it that that's not nice but man wow okay it is tough when you are an interviewer this is something if you are a candidate you you must you have to understand have to understand uh people that are doing job interviews right they're they're, they're sitting there and they're, they're kind of interviewing candidates they're busy they have full-time jobs right and they're being asked to kind of help bring new talent in the company and i get it and you want to be a part of it and that's their job but sort of but it's not really their job but they're tired they're probably overworked at that point because they're doing extra extra work they may have looked at your resume they may have looked at your linkedin but they're you know like you got to engage them and this is a case where the candidate there was a lot of potentially great information poor structure and way too long of answers with no check-ins right and you know one of the notes that i had given the candidate uh in our follow-up session right was to go back and re-watch their answers uh and be reasonably honest with themselves if a smart interviewer had listened to that whole answer who had no knowledge of what this person had done had no knowledge of their industry nothing uh would they be able to come away with how the feature worked this this onboarding process um whether it shipped on time did customer retention change as a result did things get better did revenues go up right any of the things that you would want to know about a product getting released um meaningful interactions did they improve did customer sat go up any of these things uh and i would submit to you that the answer there is likely no and that is what is challenging when you just speak for a long time uh you know the the visual that i like to use for people who understand um you know newspaper comics is there are three panels why do i use newspaper comics well like all things when i talk about storytelling in your answers right good structure is star format situation task action result three things uh situation task is act one action uh, is act two result is act three same thing as comics right in the newspaper you have generally sometimes four panels but generally three panels right three panels in comics however when the person speaks in the comics like you have a limited amount of space to put you know dilbert can only put so many words dogbert can't you know if they both talk but there's only so many words that can fit into that space and if you fill up all of that space with words eventually the interviewer is going to fall asleep they're going to fall asleep because they're busy and the risk of getting this higher decision wrong by passing on a good candidate is very low hiring a bad candidate that cost is very high right and if they just tune you out because you're not engaging and your executive communication skills are not great man that is a guaranteed ticket to pass town right they're just going to pass on you because they're not really going to be able to answer any substantive questions about you right because remember the, in a, in a well-run process that interviewer is going to go into the follow-up session to do the candidate debrief they're going to have to defend you if they want to hire you and if you go back and re-watch this answer and, and i understand many people will have probably dropped off because it was just it's a good example of what not to do where an answer is really just way too long uh, there were no check-ins 
poor structure, didn't allow for engagement with me as the interviewer. So it's just, it's not, it wasn't great in that regard. Uh, and so with that, all of that said, I wanna read the, the feedback that would have been read into the room for this candidate uh, for customer obsession. Uh, there were certainly times where, or sorry, sorry, there were certainly glimpses throughout the interview where the candidate was displaying customer obsession. It was clear that the candidate wanted to make their product easier for their customers to use. Candidate appropriately identified an area of opportunity and need where the onboarding process could be improved. At no point were any metrics shared regarding retention numbers, usage rates, anything that would serve as a foundation on which the interviewer could build follow-up questions to determine if there was a real problem being solved or a perceived problem that was neither real nor material to the business. Right, and so that is, it's not a great outcome for a product manager, right, to, to have that. And I think that this was in the feedback, I, uh, you know, the feedback and the coaching outside of that to this candidate was, I, it felt like there was a lot of great content hiding in a very, very poorly structured answer. And this is where, you know, kind of storytelling comes in, right? And, and you as a, as a candidate repeatedly telling a story, especially if you tell it to an audience of one, your, your wife, your girlfriend, your friend, a coworker, your kids, right? pick somebody. But if they're falling asleep, I guarantee you the interviewer is falling asleep. The interviewer is going to have trouble struggling, uh, struggle to follow along. And when they struggle to follow along, they're not going to hear everything. If they don't hear anything, they're not going to ask you meaningful follow-up questions. If they don't ask you meaningful follow-up questions, they're just kind of going to jump around in their interview and they're going to ask some questions they know about. And then you're going to get the dreaded, well, tell me about yourself or where do you see yourself in five years or what do you think you can add to the company? Those aren't substantive questions because remember your job is to convince them that you can do that job not you know well tell me about yourself that's a, just a, that's a lazy interview question but that's what happens when you run out of questions and the candidate's not engaging and you just need to fill time and you're hoping that gosh 45 minutes can't get here fast enough so just things to think about uh it is okay to speak for a long time especially the more senior you are your answer is gonna be longer that's fine but you have to figure out how to break these things up and engage with the interviewer because if you're not especially in a video medium like this right we got the camera here um so there, there are a lot of interviews happening over zoom or teams or chime or whatever and if you're putting the interviewer to sleep man they've got other things to look at i've got you know, i could be checking my phone here you have no idea that i'm on my phone my nice uh, samsung s21 ultra that's my terrible flex for the day, but okay. But you have no idea if I'm working on my phone. I mean, my eyes aren't looking at the camera, but I could be doing any number of things once I start tuning you out. And once you've lost the interviewer, you're done because they can't defend you in the debrief, right? Because they have no idea what you said. They stop paying attention. So just things for you to think about as you go uh, into your interview prep, uh, especially as you're thinking about questions around customer obsession, right? Uh, but specifically here, uh, the, the structure was just, it needed help. So that's it for this week. Uh, very long interview, but you know, that's not really my fault. It was more the candidate's fault. Sorry, but it's a good example of how not to deliver uh, an answer, and that's hopefully a learning point for everybody. Uh, the good news is, you know, obviously when you do these mock interviews, you get the feedback you need from me uh, to hopefully prepare better, uh, show up much better, and hopefully land your dream job. If you find this content useful, I would really appreciate it if you go ahead and click uh, the like button down below. It tells YouTube that I'm gonna, doing a good job. Also, they look at the view times, and you know what I've seen, especially for these mock interviews, is uh, you know people are falling off slowly, and it's called the uh, the black diamond ski run of death, where it gets down to about 20% by the end. So only about 20% of you sticking around at the end. So if you did, hey, thank you, I appreciate that. I'm gonna have to figure out either a different way to do these or just not care and keep putting out these videos because from the people who do watch them all the way to the end, I do get a lot of really nice emails and that say it's absolutely helping them in their job search. So that that is also fuel for me. Uh, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe. That also tells YouTube that I'm doing a good job, but frankly, it gives me the fuel to keep pushing forward and say, okay, I feel like I'm doing a good job because people are signing up. Uh, in the last 30 days or so, I think I've signed up um, close to 100 new subs. So, you know, that's that's something to feel good about. And I appreciate every single one of them. I answer all the questions in the comments. Uh, so if you haven't sent them, if you want to send me an email, do that too. Uh, if you do want your mock interview and you'd like to get time with me, go to interviewat.com, uh, sign up. The calendar does tend to get full. The more enterprising among you have sent me emails and we have sometimes figured out a way to make my calendar work for you. But just know that this is something I do for free to help you all out. And I do have uh, another business that I run that kind of pays the bills. And I need to make sure that that is properly tended to. So that's it for this week. And we will talk again next week.